We, uh, a few weeks ago, finished a series called Freedom, and we've done several series over the year, the course of this year, and um, in between, you know, after we finished Freedom, we did some stuff on Thanksgiving, um, and now kind of in a, a, a mini-series, if you will, that we didn't really, like, advertise, just kind of planned it, and, and it happened. And I wrote about it in the blog this week that, uh, you know, it was... I've got something to say was the title of the blog, and I talked about that. The I've stands for information, vision, and education, which are the three messages that, that I was doing, but because of the way that I did not promote it really, it was more like I've got a secret. But, so <laughs> last week talked about information, and that's where we were standing up and raising hands and saying all the things that God's done here at Antelope Springs Church over the year, you know, with the new people coming, new people coming into membership, people accepting Christ, People participating in small groups, all those different things that we've been doing over the course of this year. And so we did um, what I call the Christian aerobics, you know, where you're raising your hand, you're standing up, you're sitting down. Um, if, you, if you come from high church background, you know all about that. Stand up, sit down, kneel, stand, bow, pray. Right? Um, so we kind of did that and talked about all the things that God had done over the course of this past year. Today, you're talking about vision. We're talking about what God's going to do in next year, in 2014. But honestly, I can't really say specifically what God's going to do in 2014 because he's God and no one but God has known the mind of God. And so we're just waiting to see. But what we do know is that as we continue to stick to the basics, worship, reach, connect, grow, serve, continue to be obedient in his leading, he will be here with us. And so as I was preparing this message in Joshua chapter 5, which we'll be in today, if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and open to Joshua chapter 5. Um, if you need a Bible, we've got some on the cart there. We'll get that for you. you. Just raise your hand and we'll get you a Bible. But we'll be in Joshua chapter 5. We're going to do the whole chapter, all the whole chapter, all 15 verses of it um, today. So <clears throat> it just continues in the message. We started last week talking about how the God had stopped the Jordan River and the people crossed over into the Promised Land. And this is really the fulfillment of what God had done. And so as I was going through this, I see, um, I saw, still see uh, this this interaction between God and his people is kind of a dance. And, you know, there's, there's things in a dance, right? You, sometimes you need music. Sometimes you make your own music when you dance. Um, it's probably best to have certain moves to do with a dance um, and not just go crazy and make up your own moves. If you uh, remember the series Seinfeld and that wonderful episode where Elaine was dancing, right, with a... <laughs> and she's... <laughs> And she just thought she was getting good, and everyone was you know, laughing at her because it just looked about as well as I did. Um, but that's was great, thanks. <laughs> we'll talk more specifically about things uh, next year, but I just want to talk about this dance that, uh, that happens. So, um, you know, with moves, with music, choreography is really helpful, too. We went to a, a dance production last night at the high school um, in Roseville, and it was pretty cool. I mean, it was it was tiring watching all of this. I was, you know, getting that was my aerobics just just uh, watching those kids dance around. But the impressive thing was is that the the dances were choreographed by students. Students there, they put them on, which is really impressive if you can picture, you know, a stage. I don't know how big it was, but it was a big stage, uh, full of people all doing the same moves, coming on stage and off stage, uh, in the dark, in between numbers, but even during the dances, they're moving on stage and off stage. And, you know, if you didn't have that planned, if you didn't have a structure in place, choreography, people would be tripping over each other, people would be falling, people would get hurt. And so this is kind of the interaction with God and his people. When he establishes the choreography and tells us what to do and we follow, then things can move around and, and look really beautiful and be very impressive. Um, and again, that can happen when we're obedient and following God. So as we follow these basics, what's kind of happened, i got to give a little information here. Um, we adjusted the annual business meeting from December to January. So it's the third Sunday in January. This is where we'll vote on the budget. Uh, we'll, we'll vote on the, uh, the nominees for elder, deacon, and deaconess. 
And we did that because uh, we were just seeing the, the difficulty of trying to, you know, plan for the next year when the year wasn't over and, you know, the rush of Christmas time and, and you know, in between Thanksgiving, all the things that were going on, trying to cram in a business meeting in December wasn't working too well, so we moved it to January. So at that time, we'll, we'll see if there's new elders on board. Uh, and then after that, we're going to go away on an advance because we don't retreat, we advance, we attack the gates of hell, and nothing can, can withstand them as we do that, right? Amen. So w- what we want to do is just spend a lot of time in prayer and, and listen to God and say, hey, as, as we do these worship, reach, connect, grow, serve, what's it going to look like? You know, How is it going to appear? What specific things do you want us to do, God? When we take all of the ministries, all of the programs, all of the things that make up Antelope Springs Church and throw it into this big pot and boil things down to the essentials, you know, what, what does that look like? What will we say yes to? What will we say no to? What direction are we going to go? And so sometime after that, I'll be able to tell you in a vision message of specifically, you know, we're going to do X, Y, and Z and reach. We're going to do A, B, C and serve. But until then, I can't really do that, so I just get to talk about dancing. So, the future of ASC, what's going to look like? What's going to happen? I can't tell you numbers, dates, things like that. I mean, I guarantee you there'll be January, February, March, April, May, June, July, right? The guarantee those dates, un- unless Jesus comes back and cuts things short, which we pray for. But in the meantime, what it's going to look like is us, God's people, interacting with God uh, in a beautiful dance. I know uh, married men, don't really care to dance anymore, right? <clears throat> but this dancing with God and his people is, is, a, is an appropriate metaphor. When God talks about his people, Israel, in the Old Testament, he refers to them at times as his bride. When we talk about the church in the New Testament, it is the bride of Christ. And so what's the, one of the things that brides and grooms do traditionally at their wedding? Dance, yes. And it's the, the combination of them coming together in this uh, beautiful relationship uh, that grows. So that's what we're going to look at today. What is it like to dance with Yahweh? And you can stand with me for the reading of the word. It's Joshua chapter 5, verse 1. It should be on the screen behind me. And yes, again, I apologize. Um, when you do a PowerPoint on your computer and you set the background image to 85% transparency, it looks really good. Um, Computers don't talk to projectors so much, and so it doesn't translate as well here. But uh, Joshua chapter 5, verse 1. As soon as the kings of the Amorites, who were beyond the Jordan to the west, and all the kings of the Canaanites, who were by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan for the people of Israel until they had crossed over, their hearts melted and there was no longer any spirit in them because of the people of Israel. Heavenly Father, studying your word, talking about the future of your church, talking about our relationship with you, both individually and corporately, um, you are the conductor, you are the composer, you are the choreographer. This is your dance that we are dancing, Lord. And we want it to be pleasing to you, We want to interact with you in this wonderful, beautiful way of being obedient to you. As you step out and lead, we want to follow, that you may be glorified. So, Lord, that's what we ask. We ask your blessing upon this day and your glory forever. In Jesus' name, amen. So the first thing that we see is right there in verse 1. What is it like to dance with Yahweh? Well, observers are affected by the dance. So the Israelites crossed the Jordan River in response to God drying it up. Actually, God said, I'll stop the river, have the priests step out into it. And once the priests took that step in response and obedience to him and stepped into the river, the waters dried up, then they crossed. Now they're in hostile territory. And so... God's got to protect his people. He's got to put this hedge of protection around him. And his magnificent display of this miraculous stopping of the river, the invasion of almost 2 million men, women, and children into the promised land causes the people that are there to get scared. Okay? They're scared. They lock their doors. They, they bolt the, the gates. They don't want the Israelites to come in. 
which helps out because the Israelites have to do something that we'll see in a second that they need to recover from. So they need this time, this space uh, to gather their thoughts now that they've stepped out of the wilderness and into the promised land. But, you know, as we, as the, as the church, we don't want to scare people. But that's just not the, the, the good news, if you will. <laughs> you know, boo, God's here. Get scared. Um, <laughs> there's, it's good to have a healthy fear of God, but we don't want people to be scared of God. We don't people, want people to be scared of us. We want to uh, give the good news in a way that is, it's a funny word, winsome, um, but it's an appropriate one. It's, you know, it's, it's attractive. It's good. Uh, and so we want to do that. Now, God's people have been having an effect on the people around them forever uh, since God created things and had his people. In the time of the church, when Jesus came, he had 12 apostles, and he told them to, you know, go spread the good news, and they started doing that. And in Acts 2.47, uh, Jerusalem at the time, the Jerusalem church, the way they were living their lives, they were studying the word, they were in prayer, they were in fellowship, uh, they were sharing things so that there was no needs amongst them. And the people of Jerusalem, the Jews in Jerusalem, saw that. And in Acts verse, chapter 2, verse 47, it says that they had favor with all the people. So they were having an effect on their community around them because they saw what a wonderful thing God was doing and the people appreciated. Now the church has continued to do that for over 2,000 years now. And so let's look at this video that talks about what uh, the church has done. It's from Back to Church Day in, two, in September, which we did not participate in, but I got the video, so let's watch it. What is church? Is it a building? With some pews? A piano? And stained glass? Or is it something more? 2,000 years ago, the church was born. It wasn't made up of the famous, the rich, or the powerful. It was made up of everyday people who passionately believed in the message of Jesus. It was the beginning of a revolution of love and freedom that would change the world forever. In 369 AD, the church built the first hospital as a place to care for those who cannot care for themselves. Today, the church is the largest single provider of healthcare in history. The church was the first to stand up for the rights of children, creating the first and largest orphanage system in the world. 100 out of the first 110 universities in America were founded as Christian institutions. Places like Harvard, Dartmouth, Yale, and Princeton. Much of the world's greatest art, architecture, literature, and music has been shaped by the church. But the impact of the church isn't just ancient history. Today, the church is stronger than ever and continues to impact every corner of the world. Over 300,000 churches in America and almost 5 million churches around the world stand ready to be instruments of change, to do what governments could never do. Every day, the church brings food and fresh water to millions of people across the world. It has a renewed passion to help widows and orphans and fights to free slaves in every part of the world. It stands ready as a first responder on the scene to provide relief for victims of disease. The ripple of Jesus' impact can be clearly seen and felt in the church today. And it's made up of people like me and you. Today, you didn't just come to a building. You came to a revolution 2,000 years in the making. The world is facing as much trouble as ever. But we are not afraid. We were created for such a time as this. We will continue to do what we've always done. Proclaim the message of Jesus to help a world that needs him so desperately. Welcome. 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 Welcome to church. I like what that guy says. A revolution 2,000 years in the making. And um, that's one of the things that I know will happen next year is we will continue to do some of the things that we already do. Um, helping the homeless, uh, gathering clothing, giving food out of our food closet, serving at Union Gospel Mission, uh, helping our brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, we gave, what did it end up, if you recall, a few months ago, there was a church that was uh, in Washington, one of the North American Baptist churches that was a victim of arson. I'm almost there, hold on. <laughs> and... Um, Spur of the moment, sort of. I mean, we got the notice and, and just, you know, me standing up here saying, hey, one of our sister churches was burned to the ground. They lost everything. And you guys helped out with over $500 
to that church. I mean, just like it was, you know, it wasn't like send your money in later. It was today. Money in your pocket. Uh, you guys gave up over $500 to send to that church, which was way more than they were asking for every any single church. But um, that's the giving type of church that we have. We do that. When people see that, when people see that we care for each other, when people see that we care for those in need, they'll see us dancing with God. It will have this effect on the people around us. And so when they see that uh, there's this effect, when we see that we respond to God, they'll see our commitment, which is the second thing um, about dancing with God. You must be committed to be his partner. And in Joshua chapter 5, verses 2 through 9, I'm not going to read them because it's too painful. Um, What we see is they've wandered around in the desert for 40 years. And way back in time, when God first talked to Abraham and said, hey, I'll be your God, you're going to be a great nation and all this stuff. And as your sign, as the sign of your covenant with me, your agreement, your commitment with me, uh, you and all your males will be circumcised from here on forth. So um, that's, that's what happened. And that was what distinguished the Israelites, the Jews, from everyone else in the Gentile world, is that the males were circumcised at the, on the eighth day. But when they were wandering around in the desert, they hadn't done that. And so now that they enter the promised land, God says, told you I was going to bring you here. Okay, Told you I was going to stop the water. Told you you're going to be in a land flowing with milk and honey. Um, now tell me that you're committed to me. Renew the covenant with me. Just like taking wedding vows, just like signing a, a, a contract with somebody, uh, this was the sign of their contract with God. So he really wanted the covenant to be renewed and, and to people to do that. So this is what they did. The other sign of commitment that they showed is in chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. The sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh passed over armed before the people of Israel as Moses had told them. About 40,000 ready for war passed over before the Lord for battle to the plains of Jericho. That's two and a half tribes out of the 12 that they were herders. They um, They had livestock and stuff. And when they reached the river, the Jordan River, to cross into the Promised Land, they kind of looked around and went, hmm, Looks pretty green here. It's pretty nice pastures. We can build shelters for our livestock. We can build cities. Uh, We don't have to cross that big river where the giants are. We want to stay here, Moses. And Moses told the Lord. The Lord said, okay, that's fine. But um, they can't leave their brothers and sisters hanging. They've got to send warriors over into the promised land and fight for their brothers and sisters so that they get theirs as well. So there's these two and a half tribes on the east side of the Jordan who say, hey, we're, we're good. We want to stay here. Um, but we'll send our fighting men. So they send 40,000 guys over there to help fight in the promised land so that the rest of the tribes of Israel can have their own as well. So God really wants commitment from his people. Now, as Christians, you know, what does that look like? Well, one of the things that we talked about in in the leadership meeting in September is, you know, answering these questions. First off, God wants us to be passionate about loving God and loving others. We call that the great commandment, love God, love others. Um, The other thing that he wants us to be passionate about is showing compassion to those in need, and that's the great compassion, and we do that in a variety of ways. But the final thing is the great commission. What are we going to do to reach our community? And we said we're going to reach inside and out, to reach everyone who doesn't know Jesus and introduce them. To Jesus. Okay. So when Jesus gave this great commission, he said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all I have commanded you. He also said it in Mark as go therefore and preach the gospel to all creation. It is the commission, it is what we are supposed to do in response to God loving us. God loved us so much that he sent his only son, Jesus, to earth in the form of a man, sweet little baby Jesus who grew up and lived a perfect, sinless life, who was nailed to a cross, taking all of our sins with it, with him. He paid the price so that we could have a relationship with God. God, again, just like he always does with his people, did something first and asked for something in return. When when he gave the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, the first thing he said is, 
I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. He spoke what he did first. I brought you out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. It is always God moving first towards us in our lives and asking for commitment and response. So the same thing. He sent Jesus. He paid for our sins so we can have a relationship. And what he asked for commitment of Christians is to let people know about that, to share the good news, to share the gospel. So if you're committed, which you ought to be, right? You want to do that. And it may take something, okay? If you don't know how to share your faith, then make the commitment to learn. If all you know of the Bible is something as simple as John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life, share that. If you know this Bible this book of books from beginning to end, that God created everything. He created man, man's sin, the fall, separation, God working in the lives of his people to restore and redeem them, the people going back and forth, God working and working, God coming to earth as a man of Jesus Christ, living a sinless life, establishing the church, the church growing and growing to the good news being spread forever to the end when revelation, when Jesus comes back, then share that. But, but do something. To not share your faith, to not share the good news, is to walk around with the answer for life's problems in your pocket. The, the answer for pain and suffering. The answer for, why am I here? Is there anything after this life? And as you have conversations with people who are hurting, you know, reaching that one arm out, it's okay, it's okay. And walking away with that answer for their problems still in your hand. Let your light shine. God sent his son for your salvation. And when you enter into that agreement, part of your commitment then is to tell others. Okay. So when you're dancing with God, when we're dancing with God, we have to be committed to this. Okay. Dancing takes commitment, as we see in this picture here. But the other thing it takes is timing. Okay. For that person who takes that leap of faith, they need their partner to be there. They're trusting. That's the, the commitment part. Uh, if their partner is off a beat or two and facing the wrong way when they jump, guess what happens? People fall. People get hurt. Okay. So the next thing is that we want to try and follow God's steadfast, perfect timing. And in Joshua chapter 5, verses 10 and 11, or 10, 11, and 12, let me read these here. While the people of Israel were encamped at Gilgal, they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month, in the evening on the plains of Jericho. And the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate of the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. And the manna ceased the day after they ate of the produce of the land. And there was no longer manna for the people of Israel, but they ate of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. That makes sense, right? Pretty simple, pretty easy. I've read that dozens of times. And it wasn't until this particular time as I'm studying this and going a little bit deeper to realize just how perfect God's timing was in all of this. Okay? They spent 40 years wandering around in the desert, and they enter into the promised land on the 10th day of the month, the month of Abib, which way back in Israel, or excuse me, in Egypt, God had said, okay, I'm starting a new calendar for you. So this is the first month of the calendar. It's the month of Abib. And uh, on the 10th day of this month, you will select the lamb for the Passover. So that's the day they entered the promised land here in Joshua chapter 5. They select the lamb. The lamb is either for just the family or if you have a small family. It's, but when you do the Passover, the whole thing has to be eaten and whatever's left is burned the next day. So they move into the promised land on the 10th of the month, the day that they select the lamb for the Passover. They renew the covenant, uh, which means circumcision, which means they need a little bit of time to heal. So four days later, they're healed. They're ready to celebrate the Passover. That night, the lamb is killed, cooked, and eaten. And the next day, if there's anything less, like I said, it's burned up. But the next day is the 15th of the month, the 15th of Abib, which happens to be the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which lasts for seven days. So what do they get on that day? Fruit of the land parched grain. They get to eat. They get to celebrate this feast that God way back had told them, hey, Moses, 
here's what's going to happen when you move into the promised land. You're going to celebrate these feasts, you know, and as you're reading, this is in Exodus 12 and 13 and Leviticus 23, where it talks about all these feasts. You're going through that. I know if you've ever read it, you're like, what is the point of all this? You know, given all these instructions for these feasts and stuff. Yeah, okay, get it. When they get there, they're going to celebrate. Did you get that the day they get there, they're getting ready to celebrate? 40 years in the desert, who else but God would plan it that they move in on that day? The day after the Feast of Unleavened Bread, on the 16th of Abib, is the Feast of First Fruits, where you take your first crop and you offer it up to God. Manna ceases to appear. They don't need it anymore. God's taken care of them. He's given them fruit of the land, just like he promised. Once again, God fulfilled his promises in his perfect timing. Just to show it another way in this this graphic here, okay? The Passover. When they're in Egypt, if you remember, the Passover was the night where the angel of the Lord went through and killed all the firstborn in Egypt, except those that had marked their doorposts with the blood from the Passover lamb. They passed over God's people and killed everybody else, all the firstborn of everybody else. The day after that, what'd they do? Pack up and split, right? Took off. So we have a Passover, Exodus from Egypt. And how did they get out of Egypt? Crossed the Red Sea. God parted the sea, they crossed it. 40 years in the wilderness. Then what does God do? Stops the Jordan River. They cross the water again. They enter the promised land. And what do they do? The Passover. So the Passover serves as bookends for this 40 years of wandering in the desert. They know it was going to happen that way? No. God did, though. God's timing is perfect, always. For us, that takes on a little different perspective. I talked last week about space. Okay, Right now, even if you look around at all the empty chairs in this room, we're probably at maximum comfortable capacity in this service, and it's even fuller in in first service. So we need more space. We've known this. We've been planning for it. We've been planning to build a building for like 10 years. Jim Tillman was the pastor when we first started talking about building another building in addition to this one. We we have plans to build a two-story youth and education facility right out back here. If you ever look, you'll see green stakes in the ground. Um, That's the, the footprint of the building. It'll be offices and classrooms. About a third of it will be a worship center that's open to floor to ceiling, two stories, seat about 140 people. Um, Our youth, our student ministries will use that, but we can use it for other things as well. About four or five years ago, we voted on, as a congregation, to approve funding that building. And we've had plans drawn up. We've been working with the county to get permits. We've been working with... Everybody that has water rights to try and get water because we're on a well system here. You guys want to know how to be rich in California? Have water rights. <laughs> have water rights. Um, so we've been working on all these things. We've been you know, planning all this. We've been knowing that we need the space. We've been doing all these things. And guess what? There's still no building. Because <laughs> it's not God's perfect time yet. But there will be a building. Um, we cannot continue to be obedient to God, continue to see him bless us with uh, more people coming and and hearing about Jesus here and and not have this space. But imagine what it'll be like, say, if you have kids that go to Awana on Wednesday night, you bring them here, you drop them off for Awana, and you walk to the next building and go have your small group meeting. And then you come back and take them home. No driving and dropping off and then going to small group and then coming back to church and then going home, all that driving. Same thing on Sunday. Come here, have service, go to Sunday school class or small group, head home. Or Tuesday night for, you know, refuge, high school, went Thursday night for wild side. It's very exciting, the possibilities that are out there. And again, it'll happen in God's perfect timing. Um, just like God promised, I don't know if, if he promised a building, but he certainly said, you know, if you do what I say, then I'm going to bless you and, and bring people. But he promised that there would be a Passover, that it would happen in the promised land, that there would be a feast of first fruits and a feast of unleavened bread. He promised all these things, and his promises came true in his perfect 
time. One of, uh, one of the people at church here wrote to me and said, God always has a perfect time for everything because God is perfect. And so things will happen in his time. <clears throat> Unfortunately, his time's not always our time, even though I try to tell him, look, now would be a good time to do this. <laughs> he just smiles and nods. His time is perfect, okay? <clears throat> the other thing is, it won't always look like what we expect. It won't always look like what we expect, which is why we need to watch and see what God looks like in our lives. So God's perfect timing may not look like what we expect, but he is still here with us. Just like he provided manna in the wilderness and then food in the promised land and changed the look of it, but God was still providing. So it, when we're obedient and, and following his direction and worship, reaching, connecting, growing, serving, doing these things, as long as we're doing those essentials, those won't change. What things look like may. Uh, our student ministries may look differently, but they'll still be following those purposes. Our children's ministry may look different, but it'll still be following those principles. Our adult ministries may look different, but we'll still be following those principles. So that's what we need to look at. Is God working? And so that's the, the last one there, is watch for costume changes. God's appearances. That's one of the things that impressed me the most last night was that they had so many different costumes, that they were able to change them so quickly, um, that I wonder how much it cost the parents. <laughs> who, who could sew that many different costumes? Uh, but, but they did it. So, uh, In Joshua chapter 5, verses 13 through 15, they're now over into the promised land, and they've celebrated the Passover, and Joshua's checking things out. He's sizing up Jericho. That's the first city that they're going to take. And it says, When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? Basically, are you one of ours or one of theirs? That's what he asked. And he said, No, or neither. But I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does... That was the other thing last night when they were singing the Christmas songs and talking about the King of Kings and Jesus. You may not believe it, but I got choked up and teary-eyed a little bit. Um, and then irritated when they were doing the Heine shake, talking about, you know, the verse just happened to be like, you know, King Jesus or whatever. Anyway, all right. Humor broke up that emotional response. Here we go. Verse 14 again. And he said, no, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. So, where else did we hear that phrase, take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy, if you remember. In Exodus, Moses, right? God speaking to Moses through the burning bush. So, the angel, of the commander of the Lord's army, saying that, what do you think then? What's the first thing you think? God's presence, Right? God's presence. This is holy ground. Joshua fell and worshiped and said, "My, what does my Lord want? <clears throat> in different times in the Bible, God shows up uh, with Abraham as they're about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. There is the Lord, and uh, Abraham recognizes this. God, though, is spirit. This is what the Bible says. God is spirit, and so you can't see spirit. But when do we see God? Jesus, right? When we see God, he came to earth as a man so that we could see him. No one has seen the Father, it says, except the Son, Jesus. So here is God incarnate, but yet Jesus hasn't been born yet. So theologians like myself say, look, when God is shown incarnate or shown as a physical presence, before Jesus is born, this is actually Jesus showing up so that people can see and go, okay, that's it. Um, theologians like the producers of the Bible miniseries, right? Did you see the miniseries, the Bible? Okay. 
Those producers knew that, believed the same thing. And so when that person, when the Lord is standing there with Abraham, you don't see his face, you see his back, you hear his voice, and it's the same actor who portrays Jesus later on in the miniseries. So these pre-incarnate appearances of God, I believe, are Jesus. He changes his appearance, but he doesn't change his nature or his essence. Uh, speaking of the Bible miniseries, they had so much extra footage filming in the desert of Morocco that they were coming out with a film, a feature-length film, in theaters in February called The Son of God, and it's the story of Jesus. And it's the first time in 10 years or so uh, since there's been a movie about Jesus in the theaters. Last time was Passion of the Christ, and that was rated R, so you couldn't really take your kids to see it because it was pretty violent and brutal. They just got back the rating for this movie, The Son of God. Do you know what it is? PG-13, which means that you can take your kids and hear, see the story of Jesus on the big screen. So shameless plug for that because I love Jesus, and hey, if we're going to put him in Hollywood, let's do it, but let's do it right, and that's what they did. They've done it right. So God appeared to the Israelites in the wilderness like this in a column of fire at night over the tabernacle and a column of cloud by day. When the cloud rose up and took off, they followed it, and when the cloud stopped, they set up camp. Forty years of this, column of fire, column of cloud. Now they cross into the promised land, and God reveals himself like this, angel, commander of the Lord's army. Okay? I'm here to lead God's army to help you defeat your enemies, which are really enemies of God. And we could go on about that. But Later on, about 15 or so, 100 years later, God came to earth as a man and appeared like this. <laughs> Smiling Jesus. It's a portrait by Dan Haggerty, Grizzly Adams, right? Uh, that's my favorite picture of Jesus, because that's how I picture he'll be <laughs> when I get to heaven, smiling. Oh, Mike, you made it. Whew, that was a close one. <laughs> I said, only because of you, Lord. It wasn't because of me. No way I would have got here on my own, so I thank you for that. So the way God manifests himself uh, changes, but God and his goodness and his love and his mercy and his grace do not change. What we need to do is be on the lookout for God's sightings and how he works in our lives. And this is what it means to dance with God, that as we're doing it, he'll appear in different ways, uh, but it'll still be God. That he will provide and do things in his perfect timing, but it'll still be God. That when we're committed to him, uh, he will continue to pour out his blessings. And that as that happens, as we're dancing with him as a community of faith, and even in our individual lives, the people around us will be affected by it. So as we're dancing with God, we want to remember that we, people should see him, right? Observers should be impacted by this dance. And that when we're committed, God's timing will be perfect and he'll show himself. So as the band comes up, I want you to think about this thought for the week. As you fill out, you can fill out communication cards too and put them in that white box back there or stop at the information booth and drop them off there. Uh, the thought for the week, get your dance tickets ready because God is starting the music. Now, as I thought about this, I thought, wow, I'm really dating myself. Uh, I don't particularly remember when you needed a ticket to dance with somebody, but I saw it in cartoons as a kid, okay? And so that's what I was thinking. I went, wow, you just like totally alienated about half of your audience when you said this dance ticket thing. Uh, but then I started thinking about it. And so if you're my age uh, or older, you remember dance tickets or seen or heard about dance tickets where you need a ticket to dance with somebody. If you're younger than me, then when I'm talking about dance tickets, I'm talking about the 50 bucks you had to shell out to go to prom. Okay. Yeah. Either way, the dance is, is starting. So uh, get ready. And so your next step is a pretty simple one. I'll put on my dancing shoes and, and I'll look for God as costume changes, and, and I'll be ready for his perfect timing. But get your dancing shoes on and get ready, because this is what's going to happen in 2014. We're going to be working with God, and he's going to be glorified. So let's pray. Father God, thank you for this day, for uh, the opportunity to see how you worked in the lives of the Israelites and uh, provided for them in perfect, perfect timing, incredibly perfect timing. When we look back, we can see that. Um, but we can have faith in the here and now, that when you provide for us, it will also be perfect timing. We might not see it beforehand. We might not really get it before, you know, as it's happening, but you will provide. And so, God, as we're winding down this year and I'm looking forward to next year, 
we would just want to see you all the time and be in this wonderful dance with you of you providing, you doing something, us responding in faith, and you providing again. And so, Lord, lead us in this dance, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.